So here I want to tell you a little bit about some uh, teaching tools and tips that I use in, in my own teaching here at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, so here's some motivation. Here's uh, actually some raw data from a, a student who had a sensor put on his or her head um, to monitor brain activity uh, seven days a week, um, or for seven days, uh, every from 24-7, uh, basically. So uh, what you can see here is that when the student is in class, there's relatively little brain activity, uh, right? Whereas there's even less if you than, than when you're sleeping, right? And there's a whole lot more when you do homework or when you're in the lab. Uh, and so the idea is how can we get the brain activity of the student to look, look a bit more like this when they're in class, right? And the answer here is, is, is to activate students. So uh, one way of doing that is by peer instruction, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit about, or, or simply by answering questions in class. So let the students uh, look and discuss questions. And so to collect answers, you can use this uh, handy tool called Socrative.com. So there, there are many points for this slide. One is to show you how the tool works. One is to tell you a little bit about what represents a, a good problem. Um, and there'll be several, uh, one more slide on, on what I consider uh, a good problem. So let's just first do the mechanics, right? So you have an equation here, and based on this equation, what, what is probably not true, right? And so there are four choices, uh, not including this one, uh, E, which is don't know. So I always put in don't know because I don't want people to guess. If people honestly don't know, they should let me know, and then that means I have to lecture a bit about it. But, so the idea is now that the students discuss this and then they vote. Then they go in on their smartphone or on their laptop and they type in this address uh, on the browser. And then they have to supply this room number. So let me show you how this looks from a teacher point of view. So I have this actually on my smartphone. Right? I've asked him a multiple choice question and now I start it. Right? I have it on my smartphone, so the question here, right, that appears on the screen. Um, they don't actually see it. I started on my smartphone. Uh, right? And so this is what the student is presented with then. Right? They see the question on the screen and then they go in and say one student thinks the answer is A. Another student thinks the answer is B, for example. And so this forces the student to make a, make a choice, but they can make the choice in relative anonymity. Right? And so I see that um, one student has, or, or half the students have voted A and another half has voted B. So in, in that situation, I would then basically tell them that the vote is split. They should find somebody who voted something different. Right? And then we vote again. And actually, nine times out of ten, just from the discussion among the students, they'll, they'll arrive at the right answer. So let me end this. Okay. But in order for this to work, it's very um, important that you ask questions that lead to discussions. Right? So for example, a bad question would be, uh, what is the value of constant A? Right? That's something they have to recall, that's something they could Google, and it's really not open to discussion. Right? This is. Uh, and then, once you uh, uh, arrive at the answer, then of course you have to show them. And now, of course, it's not, uh, you don't necessarily just have to talk about the right answer, right? You can also now talk about why this, this uh, is uh, true, why, this is, why A is true, why B is true, and so forth. Right? So it, it turns into a little mini-lecture, but a mini-lecture that appears after the students have, have thought about it. Okay, you can also include uh, multimedia right, to make things a little more concrete and memorable. Right? So for example, rather than writing down the equation on top, I also show how the equation happens. Right? And from this, they can actually, they should be able to uh, guess or should be able to know that this is an exothermic reaction, which is one of the things you need 
uh, for this question. Right? And also, it, you don't just have to ask text questions, you can also ask, let's say, graphing questions. Right? So the question is, which of these lines is the correct line? So you can use multimedia, and you can use uh, graphs and other things to ask questions. Okay. So this is a technique known as, as peer instruction. Uh, I sort of summarize what you do here, right? You discuss and then the students discuss and then vote. Uh, if most of them get it right, then you simply, then you proceed. Of course, you tell them what the right answer is and why, but then you proceed. If, if about between 40 and 75 percent uh, get it right, then they should find someone else who's voted something differently, discuss, and then vote again. If less than 40% roughly uh, get it correct, then the question was too hard, uh, and they'll have a hard time finding someone who voted for the right answer. Uh, and then you need to, to lecture about it, and you should probably reconsider the question. Right? And so this approach has a lot of advantages. Right? It's active learning. Uh, the brain activity goes up. Um, they talk to and get explained difficult concepts by students or by peers who are at the, the same level who may have a, an easier time explaining things on the, on the students' terms. And you get valuable feedback about what is they consider hard or easy, and the students get valuable feedback about where they stand relative to other students. Right? And so this also strengthens conceptual understanding because if Conceptual questions are really the ones that lend themselves most to, to discussion, right? But they can be hard to assign as homework problems uh, because it really requires interactive discussion uh, with help from you. And so this is a class time where you're together with them is an, is an excellent uh, time to strengthen these uh, conceptual understandings. So that's some of the advantages. Now, what do you think some of the disadvantages are? Uh, and so here I, I, I show you another feature of Socrative, uh, that's the short answer form. So it doesn't have to be just um, multiple choice, they can also be short answer forms. So potential disadvantages, uh, and here I'm asking uh, you as a teacher. So let me show you how that works. All right, I now ask a short answer question. And so now the students here can write in uh, the answer. So, for example, uh, one disadvantage of this would be time pressure. If you feel that you have to tell the students everything they need during class, right, this takes away time from that. Uh, so that's one option. Uh, so let's see, what, what could another option be, uh, another uh, disadvantage? Uh, in this, uh, let's say, uh, if the students aren't prepared, right, then they don't really have any basis for discussing uh, this. Okay, and so here you can see, this is what I see as a teacher, two options, and now I can send this out to the students again, and they can now see what everyone else wrote and what they wrote themselves. Right? And they can now vote on what they think is the best answer. So, for example, students aren't prepared. No, I think it's the time pressure. Right? Then I get these results, and then I can then show these to the students and discuss the top, the top choices. Uh, so, again, it's kind of like generating a multiple choice answer key. So, this is another very powerful tool that, that I think is unique to Socrative. Uh, no, I don't want to report. Okay, so here I'm, I'm summarizing um, uh, potential disadvantages, right? So it takes away time from lecturing. If you feel you have to transmit all the information for the course, um, right, then you can transmit less information uh, if you take time away from voting. Uh, so also, if students feel that they should get all the information from you, the lecturer, and not from the book, then some of them will see this as a waste of time. Right? I get less information that I need for the test. 
So what can you do about that? Well, one thing is you can reduce the curriculum so you can teach less things. Uh, and I think what you'll find is when you start answering these questions, you'll, you'll realize how that the students can't really absorb all the information that you're, that you're throwing at it. And you as a teacher have to go in and pick what is most important. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, to create video lectures or assigned reading that you have to make sure that they do. Uh, so that you can use class time for discussion. So, but those are, are potential disadvantages with, with, with some solutions. Uh, other disadvantages are that, that there are new skills to be learned. So using the software itself or the, the website is relatively easy. Right? But it, it does take a little bit of practice to write good questions, to write questions that lead to good discussions. Uh, so that has to be learned by experience and by looking at what other people have done. And you also have to know how to pace this. Uh, you can't go too fast, but you can't go too slow either. Uh, and actually, if you had to err on one side, then, it's, then it would be that it's better to go a little too fast and a little too slow. Right? So when you see that more than half of the students have voted, then you should really uh, give the remaining students one or to, uh, at most two minutes to wrap it up and, and get going. So here you can you can see um, how I do it. So this is a, a screenshot from the uh, 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 the software, uh, the course site that we use. It's called Absalon, but it's very similar to I'm sure to what other schools are using. And so this is actually a quiz. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a quiz. Uh, some of this is in Danish, um, but there's six questions. It's obligatory. Uh, they don't. It's not for credit. They can try as many times as they want, and there is a deadline. And this this deadline is the night before the lecture. Okay. So what do they have to do? They have to watch five videos. The links are right here. That'll take them right to YouTube. They also have the slides for the video. And then for each video, they have to answer one question. And this is a, uh, a question that's just usually true-false. So it's, it's not a lot of questions. If they've seen the video, it's not a hard question, right? But it's, it's simply just to make sure to tell them that they actually have to do this. Uh, this could also be assigned reading instead of videos. But it really just it helps ensure that, that students come prepared for class so that you can use the class time not to tell them information, but to make sure that they've absorbed and understood the information. Uh, finally, you'll notice that there, there, are six, uh, there are five videos, but six questions. The, the last question is always, is there anything here you didn't understand that you would like me to talk about during, during lecture time before we get started on the, on the questions? Okay. Another thing that's important here is that uh, once they've, they've clicked the answer, then they get, they'll, they'll know whether it's the right or, or, or wrong answer. Okay, so they also they get immediate feedback here. So this is also a learning tool. So even if, for example, they feel that they've seen and understood the video, right, but then they're faced with a question where they answer wrong, then perhaps, hopefully, they'll go back and, and, and re-watch the video again. So it's, it's, it's also a teaching tool uh, in addition to, to sort of a, a way of keeping check on them. So what do these videos look like? Um, so uh, the one I use most is simply I make PowerPoint slides uh, and then I record uh, what's going on on the screen. I use a program called ScreenFlow, but you can also use Camtasia if you have a Windows PC. And then I use the headphones that came with my mobile phone uh, just to make sure the sound is, is a little bit better. But it's, it's basically a matter of making PowerPoint slides. And, and here comes uh, what I've made here is not the full video, but an abridged version. And actually, that reminds me that I should go back and, and mention one thing. Right? So these videos are all short. The longest video I've ever made was 10 minutes. Right? So you don't want to make videos that go on for 15 or 20 minutes or, or God forbid, 45 minutes. Right? The, 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 you have to break this down into small, manageable pieces. All right, so I have uh, the video here. I used a pointer, as you can see here. I talk, blah, 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 blah. 
uh, I can also include simulations. Right? So here I've embedded a movie in my PowerPoint slide. Right? And then I can superimpose things on that, talk about it. Right? And towards the end, then I always end with a quiz again. So there is a question here that they have to answer. So what basically, and this is again very low tech, what I tell them, here's what I want you to answer. Press the pause key in, in YouTube, think about it, and when you're ready to answer, press play. Uh, so that's what I have to do here. Once I get my mouse, press play, and then they'll get the right answer. So in these five, ten minutes, right, I, I lecture about a particular topic, but I also ask a question and take time to explain the right answer. So as you will see now the answer will will pop up here. See, and there's the right answer. I explain why the other answers are wrong and so forth. So again, students just don't sit passively and watch the video. They'll, they might do that for, for five minutes, ten minutes at the most. Right? But then they have to again do something, use their brain, make a choice, pause the video. Right? So, so videos don't have to be passive. Um, if you want to, you don't, you, you don't have to use PowerPoint. You can also use um, more like regular Blackboard um, writing. Uh, so for that I use the iPad. I have an iPad and then I downloaded the Explain Everything app and then you have to uh, buy a stylus so you can a pen that can write on the iPad. So the iPad of course is a little bit expensive but the Explain Everything app is, is cheap. It's, it's a few dollars and of course the stylus is you know 20 or so uh, dollars. But with that you can uh, and of course this will also record your voice. You probably can't hear it right but you can you can see I can I can draw here. And explain. So especially for example, if you're showing the solution to a problem, you could do this. Uh, but if you do this, you really also should provide your PowerPoint or sorry, your, your handwritten notes or whatever you're basing this on. Right? So that the students don't have to waste time writing all this down. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of advantages. In addition to freeing up class time for discussion, videos actually have an advantage, uh, many advantages over regular lecture. Right? So one is that you can watch this anytime uh, if you have more time at night or if you learn better at night or so forth, you can watch it. You can sit on the bus and watch it. Right? You can pause anytime you want. You can repeat any, anything you want. You can watch this as many times as you want. And it's just by sort of the nature of the thing, you're forced to break, to break this down into manageable pieces. Uh, maximum 10 minutes. And these 10 minutes also include a question, time for, to pose and discuss a question. So it, it activates the students much, much more than this sort of droning on in class. And as you saw, you can use animations, films of experiments um, from YouTube or anything like that. Uh, much more easily than in a regular lecture, right? And and there's also no getting behind for for you. If uh, very often, if you again transmit all the information in lecture time, it's very easy to get behind, right? Here it doesn't happen. You've made the videos already. Uh, the students can get behind. That's true, right? But you're sort of um, covered in that regard. You've made the videos, uh, and there's no way to get behind. Also, from a, a teacher point of view, uh, the alternative to this right, would be to make lecture notes. And making videos is actually much, much faster than making detailed lecture notes. Right? Because the initial step, making the, the figures you want to talk about, the equations you want to talk about, right? that's relatively fast. Uh, what takes time with lecture notes is then to write all the things you want to say about the pictures and the equations. And here, you simply just talk like you normally would. Uh, so you can generate a lot of uh, lecture note material in a, in a much shorter period of time using videos. At least that's been my experience. And so that means you, you can generate all this, uh, this material, you can cover all this material um, 
rel or you can make this relatively easily, and that gives you freedom from textbooks. Um, so this is really a, a way to augment a textbook or even to replace a textbook. Um, so if you like your textbook, that that that's fine, but most textbooks um, have some problems with it. They they contain too much stuff. Uh, when you find when you now quiz students in lecture, right, you will find that that they have a hard time absorbing all this stuff. The more the more videos you make, the more things you, they have to remember. Um, the the less right answers you will get, and there really comes a time when they can they can contain no more. Um, the textbooks are also what I would call just in case instead of just in time, right? So there are many chapters where they build up um, that are used to build up to sort of a, a final equation, say. And the main points of those chapters are really just to introduce things that, that you will need in other chapters. And that's not very motivating. Uh, so here, just in time is a much more motivating way of learning, right? You pose an interesting question, and to solve this, now you have to learn all these things, right? That's much more motivating than, well, do these, do these things, try to understand these concepts, because in a week or two, you will need it to do something interesting, right? That's, that's not terribly motivating. And again, it's just a... A, a compendium of, of stuff. It's I think most textbooks don't do a good job on telling you in this chapter, which is 50 or 70 pages sometimes, right? This is the most important, this is less important. Uh, the students don't know, right? And so it's often up, uh, up to you to, to tell them. And then they, you know, they pretend the computer and internet doesn't exist. So they have all the information has to be contained in the textbook. Right? Whereas, in fact, a lot more up-to-date and fun stuff could be looked up very easily using Google. And, and they're not taught this skill. The students are not taught this skill because they feel everything has to be in the textbook. And also, I find a lot of the, uh, most of the problems in the textbooks are, are, are dull and dumbed-down versions of problems uh, because the assumption is that you can only use a calculator, that you can't use a, a, a computer to grab things or to animate things or to look things up. So if you're not happy with your textbook, uh, making videos is a relatively easy way to get away from your textbook. Okay, now let me talk about homework. So this is a screenshot from a PDF file with the homework problems. This is for week four. I know, again, some of this is in Danish, but let me just tell you what's What's going on? There, there, there are sort of three new innovations, and and the most low-tech one, and maybe one of the most important ones, is that I uh, they have ten questions that I've made myself, and they only have to do six of them. So they can choose; they get a choice about which six they want to do. And just the, giving people a choice is actually an amazingly motivating uh, force, right? So if they have if they're frustrated with a problem and they come to you, right, you can also say, well, you don't have to do that problem. There are, there are other problems you can do, right? And this also allows me to write some, a few of these problems are, are really fairly tough, uh, meant for the more adventurous uh, students who might otherwise be bored, uh, right? And I can make them tough because it's not an obligatory problem. Uh, the other thing here is that one of the things they have to do is they have to write a new problem that looks like one of the problems assigned last week. So this forces them to write a problem themselves, which you learn a lot more from them than solving a problem that someone else made. And it forces them to think about the topics we covered last week so that they just don't get, get forgotten. And they have to put this up uh, this question up on peerwise, and other uh, students can then solve this problem. And let me get to peerwise then. The answer key is given on peerwise. So peerwise is uh, a free service. It's again, it's a, a web page where you make a login and you make a page for your class. Uh, and so you can see uh, what this says is week four, uh, problem three, week four, Problem 4A1, 
problem 4a2. So I've broken down uh, the questions into sub-answers. Right? So these are multiple part questions and I use Peerwise here to guide the student through. Um, this is how many people have answered so far. This is if they picked, most of them picked the right answer. And they can rate the question here. This is, this is the student rating. Do they think this is hard or easy or medium? So I get a lot of feedback from this. So this is what it looks like. So instead of, uh, they're presented with four possible answers, usually four, and they know one of these is the correct answer. So if the answer they worked out doesn't match any of these, right, then they know they've made a mistake. If they've done it right, they'll clearly see one of these is the correct answer. Then they pick the answer, right, and then they're presented with this screen. Uh, so here the student picks C, and they're told that B is actually the right answer. And here they can see most of the students have actually picked B. And then after, so they work through the problem, they've made their choice, and now they're given a full uh, description of how the problem is solved. So they're given this immediately after they've made their choice, right? So it's not something they hand in and then have to wait a week to get the answer back and then they can ask questions about it, right? So you get immediate feedback here, which is incredibly valuable. And they also get um, feedback from me. So not from a teaching assistant who may not have understood the problem, you know, 100%, right? They get it from me and they get it right away. Usually what I do, I solve all my, my problems in, uh, well, my chemistry problems in uh, as, as Mabel software, which is a bit like Mathematica, and I simply just cut and paste uh, from Mabel and in here. So this is just an image. And this also teaches them how I use Mabel, um, and it saves me a lot of time. I don't really have to type anything in again. Uh, but I could also make a video here, uh, a screencast, uh, where I show them how, step by step, how I solve it in Mabel, or I could do this writing it down using my iPad and explain everything, and then they see a video instead of a instead of text here. Uh, but the main thing is that they get a detailed explanation immediately after the answer, uh, and that really helps learning. Okay, so let me sort of summarize a little bit by telling you what, what I do in my courses now. So in my courses now, I've, I've in, in none of the courses I teach have I found a textbook that I, I really like. So I have no textbooks, they have videos and PowerPoint slides. And when I design my courses now, I do it in what most people would think is the reverse way. I make this problem driven. So at first I think of the homework problems that I want them to do. Right? So I don't think about the order of the chapters or anything like that. I think what are, what are real world and important problems that I want them to be able to solve. So meaningful problems, right? What they, they, that they can do. And I, of course, I always assume that they have a computer handy so all the tedious tasks are, are done with the computer. Okay, so that's the, whoops, that's the problems, uh, the homework problems. Then I think, well, what kind of concepts do they, am I, do they have to understand uh, in order to understand the problem, right? So that's the concept problems that I ask in class. So I write them second, or sketch at least how they would look, right? And so the problems and the in-class conceptual questions, that de they define the curriculum. So now I know what I need to cover. Then I make the slides. Once I make the slides, then I record the videos. And at the end, I make the, the video quizzes. Okay, so contrast this to what one would normally do. You teach a, a course. The first thing you do is you go textbook hunting. You pick a textbook, and then that textbook defines the curriculum, right? This, either the whole textbook or the first, I don't know, 12 chapters or what have you. Okay, that's the curriculum, and then the problems you assign are these very often toy problems, meaningless problems that are in the back of the book. Okay, so the advantage of doing it this way is, right, if I write relevant problems, and to me that's research relevant, so 
we're teaching chemists um, what do they need to know in order to do, let's say, a, a research project at the bachelor level or at the graduate level, right? R relevant problems means a relevant curriculum. So, so the, the constant question is, why do I have to know this, right? That, that gives you a real, you have a real answer for that now, right? You have to know this because you have to solve this problem, and this problem is important because. Um, and also this, so what this says is that what you teach and, and, and how what you teach is used is more important that, than where does it come from. Right, so by that I mean the derivation typically. So to solve the problem using an equation, you don't. The first thing you need to know is not how this equation was derived, but how you use this equation. Okay, so once you understand how to use the equation and why it's important, then you can maybe talk about where how the equation is derived or where it comes from. Okay, so you have to, as you as you'll find, you'll have to cut your your curriculum, and. That means you have to, it's not that everything isn't important, but some things are actually more important than others. And you have to make that choice, and this helps you make that choice, right? Because you deprioritize anything that doesn't contribute to the solution of the problem. So if, if some topic is not problem worthy, it's not worth writing a problem on, well, how important is it really relative to the other? And so in my personal experience, I teach a lot of physical chemistry. And that means I, I've de-emphasized derivation a lot. Um, and no one has complained about this, believe me. Uh, so in, in, at Copenhagen, we're on a quarter system. So uh, we have very condensed uh, quarters where students take two courses at once. So that means I have two back-to-back 45-minute -back lectures twice a week. Right? So, so four hours of lecturing, and then they have another four hours where they have help with, with homework problems. Now, the very first day I start a, a course, I actually do lecture. Uh, so I don't, the very first, uh, or, the, or the, the night before the very first day, I don't require them to, to, see, to see videos. I, so my lecture is maybe five, ten minutes, then I'll ask a question where we vote, and then I'll lecture, ask a question, and then we vote. Uh, but after that, after that first uh, day, right? I also make it very clear. Now you have you will get videos that you have to watch twice a week, and you have to take the the quiz. Uh, the video slides are available before, uh, so they have the video slides as they're watching the video. Of course, the I, the answers to the questions I ask in the videos are deleted. Um, and then the quiz, I've talked about this one question per video, and the deadline is midnight before the, the day of the lecture. The last question I've talked about. And my lecture period starts with, whoops, uh, with any questions that, that you have about the videos. So I might have to lecture a little bit before I start asking questions if the videos weren't clear. Okay, now here comes something really important. So. I ask in, in these um, 90 minutes plus break, right? I have time to ask about 12 questions, plus minus. Half these questions are review questions from previous weeks. Okay, and I do that because I find that I did an experiment. I, I, I wrote a question uh, based on something in a video that they watched the night before. 100% of the students get the question right. Okay. Then I then I wait a week or two, right? And then I ask the exact same question, and maybe if I'm lucky, fifty percent get it right. Okay. So just covering something once is not enough for it to stick, right? So if you want people to really understand and absorb something, you need to review it again and again. So I spend half my time on review questions, and then the other half on questions uh, on the new day's topic. And so that might seem very little, right? I only ask six questions. But of course, I'll ask more questions on this topic in following weeks, right? But I basically sort of spread it out. 
Okay, but that means I have to design my course so that the most important stuff, the one, I, the, the stuff I want to ask about again and again, I have to put that first in the course, so that I have many weeks to ask questions about it. Uh, most of these twelve questions or so are multiple choice. Uh, one or two of them will be these short answer questions. Uh, these short answer questions are are they're much easier to write. <laughs> But they're, they're actually very exhausting for the students. I find that if I ask more than one or two, they, they just get exhausted. They just, they just give up. It's much easier for them to, to pick the right choice based on, on answers. So you have to remember now that, I mean, this is the, con the students are constantly talking and discussion, discussing. And so at the end of 90 minutes, even though they had a 15-minute break, I mean, these, these students are actually quite tired. Uh, you, should, you should imagine... Uh, how you feel after a 90-minute lecture, right? The students are somewhat refreshed because they've slept a little uh, during your lecturing, but you're quite exhausted. Well, now it's really the other way around. Um, then the, the, all the slides with the questions uh, are then, I then make available afterwards. So they have all this material, even though they don't have a textbook. And of course, I provide the homework answers on, on Peerwise, as I showed you previously. Okay, so uh, a general summary. So I've introduced some tools that you can see here, and here are some prices. Now that's in Danish kroner, but uh, I'm sure you can you can look these things up on, on the web. Uh, and what you'll see when you download these things, um, these are very easy to use. Uh, so the, 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 the thing here is not really how to use the tools. Right. As you'll find, the thing is really is how to use them well. Uh, and so I've introduced some, some um, didactic tools. Uh, so that's just a fancy word for, for tips and tricks uh, that, that hopefully helps you, you guide how you use these, these tools here. Because if you make, if you ask boring questions, that, that you can't really discuss, then people are not going to like questions in class any, any more than lectures. Right? Or if you make video lectures on, on boring topics, on topics that, that they, the student can't see the relevance of because maybe you're introducing this because they're going to use it in a course a year from now. Right? That's, that's, they're not going to like the, 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 the lectures. And it's not because they prefer real lectures to video lectures. Right? It's just because they don't like what you're lecturing about. Okay, so it's just as important to, to really think about what you're doing didactically. Right? So active learning. So learning by doing. They're, they're going to learn more by doing than by listening. Okay, so the flipped classroom approach, approach is very good for this. Right? So the lecturing that's done at home with videos and in class, you then they then work on questions and discuss questions, right? Whereas normally that would be flipped. Peer instructions. Uh, the peers are often better at explaining things than you are because they're on the same level. Uh, cognitive load, right? As you'll find, you can you as a person. So it's not just students; it's also you. If you're honest with yourself, right? You can learn three or four new things at a time. Let's say for for a lecture or for a week. And if you look at your curriculum and look at all the new things that they have to know, right, what you will find is that the cognitive load is, is way too high. You have to, you as a teacher, your, your main responsibility is to prioritize. Uh, spaced learning, that's another um, thing. It's things doesn't, Concepts don't stick until you've seen them three or four times over a period of time. So, th for example, think about a, a foreign language, right? You, you, you can't be told the, the Russian word for phone book once and then be expected, not then don't use it, and then be expected to know what it is two weeks later, right? You, you, you have to practice over and over again. And if you load, if you never review in class and you keep loading new things on their shoulders again and again, Right? That's not going to work. Right? You have to make room for spaced learning. Also, formative, formative, formative assessment. If you get immediate feedback, and if you're not completely stressed out because these questions count for points, 
then answering questions is an excellent way of, of learning. Right? So you learn by answering questions, but only if you get immediate feedback and only if the pressure is off. Right? And by pressure I mean points. Also, if these count for a lot of points, you can't give immediate feedback because then students will just share the answers. If you remove this point pressure, you can give immediate feedback and asking questions in the video, in the what I call the reading quiz, during lecture, and so forth. That's an excellent way of learning. Right? And finally, this when you design your curriculum, this just-in-case versus just-in-time approach is, is really important. This just-in-case, you'll need to know this later, is not a good motivator for, for, for teaching. And, and there's no real need uh, for using that. In, in fact, it's pointless, right? Because this just-in-case assumes that something they've been taught once, right? I don't know, two weeks ago or or two months ago that they'll remember they won't. If you don't believe me, ask them. Ask the question in class and you'll find they can't remember anything. Right? Not because they're poor students, but because they're human beings. Right? So once you realize that this just in case doesn't work, right, then you might as well do just in time. And that's going to lead to much more motivating and relevant curriculum. Okay, now uh, this this is a long list here, and I didn't uh, one day wake up and completely did all my courses like this overnight. Right? I introduced things gradually, and so that's definitely what I propose that you do. Right? Because there is also a little bit of a learning curve in all of this with the programs and how to use them. Right? So to, to set yourself manageable goals. Right? So just say, okay. In, in my course, um, in one of the lectures in my courses, right, I'm going to ask one Socrative review question. Okay, and just start with that. Just start. It doesn't have to be the any particular lecture or anything. Just start, get the feedback, learn how to use the tools, and then really and think about what you what you learn, right? And so once you've done that, once you've completed your goal, you can feel good about yourself, and maybe you want to do it a lot more next time you teach the class. Uh, or make one video, right? For example, with the solution to a, a really hard work, homework problem. Um, and so again here, just don't go through the mechanics, right? Focus in the video on the strategy. So, so what, how should the strategy for solving the problem? Uh, or make one five uh, question online review quiz, right? So pick a random week, Right? Maybe, I don't know, a couple of weeks into the course, make a very short quiz. Don't make a long quiz that they're not going to be motivated to, to do. Right? Make a short quiz, tell them it doesn't count for points, it's just to show yourself how much you remember. Right? And this quiz you can do um, using one of your, uh, using the, 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 the page system that you use for your, your, your courses. Right? So, so just one of those in one course, right? Set that as your goal, and there's a reasonably good chance uh, that that you that you'll meet this goal, and then you can set more ambitious goals later. Okay, now, but but as you're doing this, uh, and this is just as important. I mean, start. I really encourage you to ask yourself some tough questions here about why you're teaching what you're teaching, and and how your students are feeling. Right, and so I can't emphasize this enough. All these things up here. Right, the the you get the maximum output from this if you if you really think about and try to address what's what's wrong, if anything, down here. Okay, and then uh, some inspiration. There's a lot of stuff on the web. Now I'm not going to read this out to you. I'll put all these links uh, here on YouTube at the at the bottom, so you can go in and click on them. I I recommend all of these wholeheartedly. Okay, so thank you. I hope this was of some use and if you have any questions, you know, there's always the, the comment and question section uh, here on YouTube.